Oh, yeah. Morning Combat back at it with a little bit of bonus content. The debut here of a series that you may have heard in your ear hole in the past. Now you'll get to see the full Monty of it. Brian Campbell, your boy BC, the beige one right here. You know the guy next to me is a Hall of Famer, former UFC champion. Eh, maybe the nicest guy in the world. That's Sugar Rashad Evans. And Rashad, we used to do this little podcast called the state of combat on CBS sports, where we had story time with Rashad delving deep second by second experience by experience of your run through the ultimate fighter and your initial foray into the UFC. Why don't we take this MK style right now and just continue and we'll call it story time with sugar. You ready for this, my friend? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Always great to sit across from you here in the virtual world. And Rashad, I love your openness, your candid ability to recall. So today we're going to go back. Take me back, right? July 7th, 2007. A card, a pay-per-view called UFC 73. The Arco Arena in Sacramento, California. But for Rashad Evans, this was the first real, real, real test of what this future champion was made of a co-main event opportunity on a pay-per-view against one Tito Ortiz. Wow, brother. Wow. Rashad, can you start us off here and get us right into it? You're 27 years old. You're five and zero in the UFC. You're 10 and zero overall. It's not as if you weren't challenged in the ultimate fighter season. That, that fight with Keith Jardine that nobody ever remembers was a, was a man making brawl but you ain't never fought anybody like this. Take us back to 2007. What's going on in the head of Rashad Evans? Well, I mean, I was feeling myself for a little bit. You know, I just had two big wins, one over Jason Lambert and one over uh, Sean, Sean Salmon in devastating fashion. And at that point, you know, I just felt like there was nothing that can stop me. I was finally feeling like I was groining to the skill set that, that was just my, that was just my masterpiece. You know, I was growing into things that, um, you know, Greg taught me and all these different things was coming together to a point where I was feeling like I was unstoppable for the most part. You know, I had some great training partners with Keith Jardine and, and those guys, you know, um, George St. Pierre and those guys. So I felt as if like there was nothing that can stop me at that point. Love it. Love it. Uh, you were 27 years old. The great Tito Ortiz was 32 years old. And while you were six months removed from that fight, you mentioned your first UFC main event when you kicked Sean Salmon in the face and sent the guy to hell. I don't know if we've ever seen him again, Rashad. Shout out to Double S there. Uh, Tito Ortiz coming off of some big business too. His loss to Chuck Liddell seven months prior in their rematch. It was a third round TKO. Um, you're getting a Tito at 32, and I remember this at the time. First kind of thoughts, is he still the same, right? You know, this wasn't necessarily the same guy who defended his light heavyweight title five times, but yet in nine years, he'd only lost to Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture. So uh, what do you remember about, you know, how, how great of a challenge you expected Tito to be? Well, I mean, I thought that he'd be pretty decent, but for the most part, you know, it was looking like he was going downhill. You know what I'm saying? It just looked as if like I was at the Chuck Liddell fight and I was like, man, he just, he just seemed very afraid. And at that point, you know, I was at the point where I wanted to fight everybody and I wasn't afraid of anybody. So I'm just like, oh man, he's afraid. I'll smell that fear and I'll destroy him. But one thing that kind of threw me off game early out before the fight even happened was me and Tito Ortiz were at uh, a fight and, and I was there with my wife and we we're sitting there chilling. And he walked by me and he came by and he got into my face to the point where like we had to be separated. And it threw Ooh. me back. It threw me back because at the time, like, you know, I was, I was, I was a big trash talker and shit. I'll talk some trash, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that, you know? And, and it was just like super, super real. You know, I was like, man, you know, I mean, cause you, you, you find a, you, you sign a contract to fight people and you don't expect that they're going to be up in your face like that. And it was really the first time I experienced it. So I was like, oh, this is serious. You know? Now, had you been, you'd been signed to fight at that point? Uh, well, there, there were uh, rumors that we were going to fight. And I think that he already like gave it okay that we we're going to fight, but it wasn't like confirmed. Uh, but it was, uh, it, 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 was, it was something when he did that, it just made the UFC like, you know what? We got to put this fight together. You know, I'll give Tito a lot of credit because you were coming in red hot 
Uh, for those who didn't follow our series back in the audio form of story time with Rashad and going through the, the evolutions. I mean, look, you came into the ultimate fighter tournament as a very raw ex collegiate wrestler. And to your credit against heavyweights, you were able to, uh, you know, make an impact, use your athleticism, but also use your growing mind. Even if the UFC announcers and Dana white didn't want to give you full credit for that mind in the early going, he's so athletic. He hits hard. <laughs> Can a black guy be really smart too? Right. Rashad, what the hell is going on here? But my point is um, there was, there was some sort of, you know, narratives coming in for a while. It was that you couldn't finish a guy. And I think, you know, not only did you have that early ground and pound win, which helped you, but that Sean Salmon head kick, how much confidence did you really have at this point? Did you feel like you'd cleared those early hurdles holding you back? I felt like I did. You know, I felt as if once I got the Sean Salmon fight, I felt as if like I, I finally understood how to set things up properly in a cage and not force things, you know, and, and during that fight with Sean Salmon, I was forcing things a lot and, it, and I was getting stuff and I lost that first round. And then the next round I came out and I made some adjustments and, and I started to set things up and then I started to see the openings. So I thought at that point, I will go into any fight and just maintain my, keep my eyes and then I'll see the openings, you know? And, and with that fight with Tito, I'm just like, you know, Tito Ortiz, He's a big guy, but I fought bigger guys. You know what I'm saying? He's a good wrestler, but I've wrestled against better wrestlers. And he's a pretty decent striker, but I've struck with a lot of guys who are better than him. So there wasn't really anything that was making me afraid of Tito. And then the fact that I thought that he was kind of like the cowardly lion a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Like he's he, he's very, you know, very uh, in your face at times. But when you get in there, you can kind of see there's some fear in there. I love it. I love it. Uh, look, of course, we want everybody to like this video, subscribe to everything we're doing on Morning Combat in the full universe. This is our first, for, first foray, as I mentioned, into some great memories with story time with Sugar. So you can obviously key up this fight on UFC Fight Pass. It's, again, July 7th, 2007, the first Tito Ortiz, Rashad Evans fight. Uh, I'm fired up here. You can watch it in advance. You can watch it along with us here as we break things down. Uh, Rashad, let, let me set the stage here in the light heavyweight division in July of 2007. Rampage Jackson just two months earlier, May 20, May 2007, UFC 71 sent Chuck Liddell to the deep dark depths. And this was the end of that insane run where Liddell kind of put the brand on his shoulders and really was the ice man and was knocking out guy after guy. And it certainly culminated with that Tito rematch giant pay-per-view. Well, he came back quick against rampage. How much did that rampage knock out of Chuck, which took down the boogeyman, if you will, in the division lead you to believe that this Tito fight could really open the door for your own title hopes. I mean, at that point it was wide open, you know, the King was dethroned and rampage just got into the UFC and, you know, I've seen a lot of holes in this game. And I was like, you know, this, this, this title's wide open. You know, I, I think when the belt first changes hands, that's when it's most vulnerable. And I was like, you know, if I can get in there and get my opportunity, I think I can become world champion. I love it. Such a huge fight. The main event, just to remind everybody on UFC 73, Anderson Silva defending his UFC middleweight title by first round TKO against Nate Marquardt. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't that your teammate during this? Yeah. Game? Yes, that's exactly right. Me and Nate Marquardt were training for this fight. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big focus because of the fact that, you know, we were both in camp together and uh, we trained like absolutely bananas. I think, honestly, we may have overtrained, but, you know, with the whole emotion that was engulfed in the whole Tito and I uh, debacle, it, 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 it got me to the point where, you know, he kept me up at night. You know, it, it, made, it gave me anxiety to think about losing to him because all the trash that he talked and, you know, he, you know, he hit some personal, you know, he said some personal things about me. And I was just like, man, I, I got I can't lose to this guy. So it just made me train like crazy. Now, look, Tito would go on to lose something like six of seven after this fight with you. And to his credit, he kind of resurrected himself a couple of times to stay to stay, you know, relevant. But this was the last time, even though we had questions of Tito at 32, as you mentioned, is he still the same guy after the Chuck knockout in their rematch? Um, you know, there still was an opening here. Chuck had just get knocked out. If Tito can beat you and look impressive, he's got to believe the fans got to believe he's getting in there against Quentin Rampage Jackson for the title again. So certainly uh, no shortage of high stakes right here. Did you specifically believe, though? That if you won here, you could get a title shot soon as well, right after. Or was that not in your thought process at that moment? 
It wasn't my thought process. I thought about it, but for the most part, I was just really focused on on fighting Tito Ortiz. You know, it was, you know, I grew up watching Tito Ortiz, watching the bad boy, Huntington bad boy, just do his thing for the longest time in the UFC. And I was like, man, I want to be like that guy. And then to finally be standing across the cage and getting the opportunity to fight Tito, it was surreal. It was, it was really surreal, but like that surreal feeling was kind of surpassed by my dislike for him. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I started know, to hate him so much. He's, he's so damn polarizing, which they certainly get into on the this broadcast, and you can hear from the fans' reaction when he enters the Arco Arena. When he was trash-talking you throughout the build, did it annoy you? Did it intimidate you? Uh, you know, did you did you look at him and laugh? Where, how did you sort of feel that? Because you're you're 27. You're not that far removed from working at the damn funeral home. Let's be honest here. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. Um, at first, at first, I'll be honest, man. It was a little bit intimidating when when he came over to me and he jumped up in my face, you know, because you know Tito. Tito outside of the octagon is a massive, massive human being, and you just can't understand how a guy this big makes two hundred five. So <laughs> he comes up to me and, and he's all in my face, barking on me. And, and when he, when I was in front of my old lady, and uh, it kind of it kind of intimidated me for a second, but then I just had to like snap my collar back and be like, boy, you better get out my face. And then at that point, I was like, you know what, man, I I, I want I wanted to really get at him really bad. But then you know uh, his trash talking. You know, I just got it so into the trash talking with him. You know, every single interview that I did, you know, I heard he said something else. Then I had to fire back at him. And then, you know, there's a time where we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll argue. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a, it was an intense situation. I still remember my, my, uh, my uncle, my uncle really got into the whole thing. My uncle Junebug, you know, <laughs> he, yeah, my uncle Junebug got into the whole fight situation. He'll watch us trash talk together. And, uh, you know, he said to me, he said, Boy, let me tell you something. Next time Tito Ortiz get on that mic talking about bad boy, you grab that mic and you look him dead in his eye and you just say, good boy, good boy. <laughs> Uncle it'll, Junebug wilding out over here. I love it. <laughs> he was like, it'll mess his whole head up. And I was like, no, man, Uncle Junebug, I'm not going to say that, man. <laughs> well, I hope Uncle Junebug could have counseled you better on the purses for this fight, released ahead of time by the California State Athletic Commission. Rashad, I know sometimes there's bonuses, there's other things, but is this really true? This is a co-main event of a pay-per-view. You're fighting a living legend at that point. But Tito Ortiz announced purse is $210,000. Okay, it's 2007. Yeah, not great, but okay. Rashad Evans, $16,000. Please tell me so I'm missing something. Please, Rashad, okay? I'm going to get Uncle Junebug retroactively updating his ass if he's still living, okay? What happened here? 16 k What? It was 16 k It was 16 k But at that uh, point, at that point, I made it to the uh, the backroom signing bonus club, so... They they okay. they looked out they looked out for me in the back room and that's one thing I can always say about the UFC like if 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 you know they didn't like at first they didn't they weren't paying they they paid me the sixteen but then like they they made sure they took care of me in the back room though. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, Uncle Lorenzo and Dana and, and uh, <laughs> the other Fertitta Frank. All right, Rashad, let's start with the opening video package. I want to ask you first, um, because I'm never sure. Even today, sometimes you'll see guys who I know I've interviewed that can't talk and they specifically can't talk trash. Yet the video package comes on, and they're like, "I'm going to mutilate this man. He is a weak person." You're like, "Dude, that guy doesn't talk like that." Rashad Evans opens up with Tito is the biggest poser you ever want to see no fighter in him at all are you saying that are the producers helping you because that came out as badass no I, I was saying it i was saying it and i was feeling it the whole time you know it was just you know you know what happened it was like the longer i was in camp and the longer i had to focus on tito and i had to watch his tapes and i had people who trained with tito come up to me and be like oh you're going to kill him you're going to kill him the more confident i became you know almost too confident in a sense almost too confident in a sense and uh at that point i just didn't really had the respect that I should have had for him at the time. All right. Rashad goes on to say he ain't going to be right after this fight. He's never going to want to fight again. He's an entertainer. He's good for the sport, but he's an entertainer. I'm a fighter. You call them a one trick prony. There's no surprises to his game. Tito counters with after the fight, everybody's going to go Rashad who that did not age well, but uh, here we go. Uh, you're kind of preaching in this package is that Tito is washed, which plays into what we said. Ortiz basically says, underestimate me at your peril. One thing he did say, though, Rashad, is I'm used to fighting five-round fights, meaning Tito, as a 
former champion and regular title contender. This will only be three round as a co-main event. He felt coming in that would help his gas tank. He could ground and pound you much more aggressively. Uh, did the three, now you had never fought a five round up to this point. Did you have any, you know, special strategy considering this was a three rounder and did you expect to, to get a very active Tito because of that? No, nah, you know, I honestly didn't even pay attention to the fact that, you know, he's used to fight five round fights. You know, I always thought that, you know, Tito has to get somebody into his game in order to be effective with that five rounds anyway. So I wasn't really too worried about it. I felt as if like, I'll be able to nullify him and never seen where he wanted, every place he wanted to go. So I wasn't worried about it. You know, I was like, ah, five rounds. It don't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to, I thought I was going to destroy him in one round to be honest. All right. All right. Uh, do you remember anything else specifically about coach Jackson in your ear, coach wink about the game plan? You're a great wrestler. You're athletic. You are showing knockout power, but you know, Tito's one of the, at that point, one of the greatest wrestlers we've ever seen in the cage. Do you remember what kind of strategy you're walking into the cage with that night? Yeah. What we're going to do, we're going to just, uh, we're, we're going to pop and move, touch and move, touch and move in and out, in and out. And what we were trying to do is we're trying to frustrate Tito to get him to make mistakes because Tito's a very cerebral fighter. And sometimes he gets frustrated and you can see him just the growing frustration in there. And that's when he starts making big mistakes. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to frustrate him and just, you know, get him, get him a little bit off balance, using quickness, using fakes and feints and using a lot of stops and goals to really disrupt his timing with the takedown. Uh, Rashad, the announced team was a three-man booth. I've I've said recently that I'm loving the work that right now in, in 2021 that John Anik, Daniel Cormier, and Joe Rogan do together. It can be a it can it can sound like a Joe Rogan fight companion podcast. It's wild, it's funny, it's great. This is my favorite announced lineup from the old days. It's Mike Goldberg, it's Joe Rogan, and it's Randy Couture, who I really think was, you know, still to this day might be the best X fighter turned into you know live fight commentator this was earlier goldie so he wasn't as cringe joe's still young and exciting but they didn't stop from bringing it to rashad during this fight as we as we'll find out as we roll on here rashad the entrances begin you enter the arena wearing a sideways black tap out hat keith jardine in your entourage your rival within the ultimate fighter now teammate and Fight Pass covers up your walkout song. That your head bobbing doesn't match. Do you remember what you walked out to for that one? Um, I believe it was a, um, it was like a mob deep, like shook ones. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. There's a mixture of cheers and boos as you come out. Did that have any effect on you? No, nah, I was used to getting booed at that point. I, I mean, I, I expected nothing else to be honest. All right, Joe Rogan reporting on the broadcast that he's talked to people in Greg Jackson's camp in New Mexico, and Rashad was so pumped up during training camp that nobody can control him or hold him down, and heavy, you were mounting heavyweights and just throwing them around. Everybody was impressed by your intensity, and Joe said he talked to you after the weigh-in the day before, and you said you were the most relaxed you ever were ahead of a fight. Is this Man. true? Because you've been honest in the past and said you've had some of those oh shit fight or flight moments before of a fight that I expect most people have but don't admit. No, I was I was coming into this fight fully charged. You know, I had a great training camp, training alongside Nate Marquardt and the people that we brought into camp between the two of us was just a you know who's who. You know, we had some great people in there. We had Paul Bonatello in there and, and the headhunter at the time, and we just had a a great collection of of all different types of people. You know, I brought um. My, one of my old college wrestlers, Nick Fichetti in, and it was, it was, uh, I, I was really, I was prepared. I was prepared as can be, you know, I was prepared every single place in, in the fight. And I was just uber confident that no matter where this fight was going to go, I was going to take it to Tito Ortiz without a problem. Well, a little bit of personal info, Mike Goldberg reporting as you enter the cage that you're seven days removed from your wedding to your first wife, Rashad. Uh, how the heck do you enter a training camp for the most important fight of your life when you're a week away from getting married, bro? There's so I always said the last six months before your wedding is the most stressful, ridiculous time ever for so many different reasons. You're entering the biggest fight of your life. I'm I, I'm going to guess you didn't have a say in the uh, in the invitations or what what font was used. You're like, I got to prepare here, honey. Well, honestly, that's, 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 that's the thing about it. Like, it was just bad timing with, with that whole situation. Like, you know, uh, I, I should have done things differently. I'll be honest, like getting married a week after your fight. I mean, it, it is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea because for the most part, you know, in order to be like, when you get married to somebody, it's, it's something that you want to 
be a part of, right? And be a part of the organi organizing. And it makes it, it makes it so that you guys are building something together from the beginning. But from, for me, I was just like, yeah, I'll just go do, yeah, plan a whole thing. I'll just go and do this fight. I was just so focused on fighting. Fighting was, fighting was my wife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I was, that, that I was, I thought I can do both. You know, if I give the most to my fighting wife and then, you know, then, 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 then to my, uh, the, the one I was going to marry, I'll be okay. Uh, did your uh, lovely ex-wife give you any warnings about not getting cut or beat up too badly for the wedding photos? Yeah, 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 she did. She did. She did. She was like, you know what, hurry up in this fight. So then that way, you know, we, you don't look all messed up for the uh, for the for the wedding pictures. And I'll very be... smart, very smart lady. And Rashad, when Tito walks in, look, this is a weird polarized crowd. He gets huge cheers on the walk to the cage. And then they boo the shit out of him when he gets announced inside the cage. Uh, wild situation. When Tito comes in with that American flag and you're watching him walk in, what are you feeling? Um, I'm, I'm, the nerves are starting to creep in. And then the enormity of, of who I'm fighting is starting to creep in too. You know, it's like I'm fighting the guy I've been watching on TV before I even decided that I was going to be a professional fighter. So it was kind of a very surreal moment. And it was like, it was like one of those perspective moments, like, look at how far you've made it, you know? So it was, it, 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 was, it was a big deal. Well, Goldberg compares uh, Tito Ortiz to Howard Cosell for his polarity. Uh, you got Joe Rogan saying Tito got the biggest reaction of any fighter, including Anderson Silva at the weigh-in the day before. So Tito's brand obviously still very strong here. The, the strengths are listed on the screen when you get to the checkpoint. The strengths for Rashad Evans. He trains with Greg Jackson. He's a good wrestler. And he's got much improved striking. <laughs> all right. All right. Strengths for Tito likes to ground and pound excellent takedowns. Great cardio. So that's uh that's the lay of the land. Big John McCarthy is your referee tail of the tape. Uh, look, five-year age advantage for you at age 27. Uh, Tito at six foot two comes in with a three inch height advantage. They were calling it four inches on the broadcast and Tito with a four inch reach advantage. Uh, the introductions go down. Rashad, you're wearing green and greenish tan shorts, and you're standing in front of a American Fighter promotional banner. Is that one of your sponsors there? Yeah, back in the day, man, that we used to load them all up, and they used to pay back. See, that's when UFC was like the best because there's so many sponsors that wanted to be a part of it. They'll pay you like 20, 15k just to even have their name on a banner. It was Damn a you, Reebok. Damn you, Reebok. You, I'm telling you. See, that's why I wasn't too much worried about the 16K because I knew that I'll get paid more than that just in sponsorship. Tito repping punishment on his banner, on his trunks. He's wearing black trunks with, with the white fiery uh, addition on there. Uh, the face off, both guys bouncing on their toes, but very cordial, Rashad. And Mike Goldberg brings out how much Tito Ortiz looks straight up bigger than you. And Rogan adds, <laughs> Tito's a huge guy. He could easily be a heavyweight. When you stood across from him, whether it be the face off at the weigh in or right now, as you're both sort of looking at each other, but nothing too angry, are you, are you going, man, this is, a, this is a big mf -er. I mean, you did fight six foot eight Brad Imes. So this isn't so, this isn't so ridiculous. I mean, it wasn't so ridiculous, but I was, I was honestly thinking like, damn, this dude is pretty big. You know, he, 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 he was pretty big, but you know what though? I was relieved that he was a lot shorter than he was when we were uh, weighing in because he wear these lifts. Tito has these lifts that he wears <laughs> and uh, he, he, he's so tall when you have him on, he's like six foot four. So it can be kind of intimidating. And, and, but, but when he was out, uh, in the cage, I was relieved that he was a little bit shorter, at least normal size. All right, good pop from the crowd as we get underway. Big John McCarthy tells you to fight. And Rashad, big moment right in the beginning. Tito Ortiz coming out with a high left head kick, which you blocked. But the strike opened up what Tito was trying to do, get you down to the ground, an explosive double leg takedown that got the crowd fired the hell up. Uh, I, I was looking to see, having not watched this fight in a long time, how your wrestling was going to match up with his. They talked on the broadcast that you're known at this point for having good takedown defense. Did this one surprise you though? It surprised me big time. You know, he froze me with that big kick. When, when someone throw, he came out and threw a big powerful kick and just blocking it right there. It kind of, it kind of, you know, you felt the power on the kick and he's like, well, I don't want to get kicked with that. But at the same time, I had to brace into it in order to stop it and me bracing into it and regathering myself afterwards, afterwards, 
he shot right in underneath me and was able to get a clean takedown right out the gate. Oh, this takedown gave Mike Goldberg a straight up hard on. You can hear it in his voice. He's fired up the crowd, which was booing Tito at times now yelling, chanting Tito, Tito, but no panic from you. I'll give you credit. You really worked on not getting your back on the ground. You're kind of half sitting up on your ass and you slowly, but patiently walked yourself back up the fence and, and got to a standing position within the next 40 seconds. Um, had you been taken down in the UFC up to this point? I'm, my, my memory is jogged. No, I have not. But one thing that I did for this fight, like I started every training session, just working endlessly on just, you know, being on the bottom, getting back up in all kinds of positions, worst scenario situations. Somebody had my back, someone had me all kinds of compromising positions and I had to find my way back up. So I felt relaxed in that situation. I didn't feel as if like he was going to be able to get me flat on my back, but I will tell you this, Tito Ortiz, was strong as 10 silverback gorillas, man. I'm not lying to you. This dude was so damn strong. I was, I look, I remember feeling like when he first got me and he took me down and he had my hand behind my back and I couldn't really move and I was trying my hardest. I was trying not to panic, but I remember looking at my corner, just seeing him on the other end of the cage and looking at him like, these mother effers just lied to me. They lied to me. This dude is strong as hell. He's not weak. <laughs> he is strong. Well, if he if he had the opening blow with that takedown, boy, did Rashad answer at three minutes and 16 seconds on the clock. You not only break free from a standing clinch, but Rashad, you start brawling for about five seconds. You are letting those hands go. The crowd leaps to their feet visibly around the cage. Tito gets caught with looking like a left hook in that. And he forces a clinch right away and backs you up to the cage. How important was that to make a statement to him? It was really important because, you know, it put him on his heels a little bit and it let him know that he just can't do whatever he wanted to do. And even if he did get me down, I was going to get back up to my feet and make him pay for it. And I actually had the power and skill to make him pay. So it, it gave me, it gave, it gave uh, me a little respect in his eyes. I feel, and, and I felt as if like at that point, you know, he knew that I can strike with him. 30 more seconds in the clinch, not much going on. And Goldie begins the narratives. He starts speculating, <laughs> well, this is the largest spotlight ever upon Rashad Evans. And that he starts to speculate that maybe nerves are becoming a factor in the face of Tito's vast experience. I mean, look, you're coming fresh off. We're kind of hitting him hard with a left hook. You got up off the ground. Is any of this true though? In this moment, was there any early on where you're doubting yourself where you're like, Holy shit, I'm in here against a former champion. And uh, this ain't easy. No, after, after I got up to my feet and I, and I shook out that initial, like, you know, feeling him out and feeling what he can do and got back up to my feet. I felt, I felt pretty comfortable in there, but I still was weary because one thing that he was able to do was he was like, I, I really had a hard time getting like kind of initially stop his shots because of the fact that I would have to pay so much attention to a striking and he'd keep my hands so high deflecting that he was just getting under all the time. So whenever I settled my feet to strike, I felt as if like he can shoot right underneath me and that did not make me feel comfortable. Well, look, for whatever we can say about what happened to Tito after this fight, which was a, a string of consecutive defeats, at least in round one, he looks fresh. He looks ready. Big John, though, calls timeout after your mouthpiece comes out, and he is pissed off at Team uh, Jackson Wink in the corner for very slowly cleaning off the mouthpiece. How did that come out? Was that due to a strike? Yeah, I think I think it was, man. I think it was due to a strike. Uh, we were, we were at, in, in exchange, and... Uh, he caught me. He was he was doing a good job of just like throwing like these little fit in uppercuts that you can barely even see. And it caught me with my mouth open, not really hard of an impact, but it was just something that made my mouthpiece fall out. And good thing it did because it allowed me the chance to kind of like sit back and just kind of be like, OK, the fight's happening. This is what I trained for. I'm ready. I'm cool. Even though he's stronger than about 10 gorillas, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> well, midway point of the round coming up about 230 on the clock. We start to see maybe a little stamina dump, maybe something out of Rashad. You start getting a little skittish. You're dancing on your toes, but you're visibly staying on the outside. You're pumping a jab, but it's very weak. It's sort of just a range finder. Uh, Tito's starting to stalk you, but he's very poised as always. But then at 205, the crowd starts booing the dancing. They can't stand this. And this is where Rogan starts speculating, hey, Maybe that takedown has made Evans very nervous about the idea of a second one. What's going on in that spot where you're looking to just kind of, 
I don't know what the hell you're doing, Rashad. Tell us, please. Well, I was moving around on the outside. I was trying to do the game plan as far as like get him frustrated. I wanted him to put his hands down and be like, all right, what are you going to do and get mad? And then that's when I was going to go and blast in on him. That's what I wanted to do. But sometimes what you want to do and what you actually do are two different things. <laughs> You can tell Tito's getting a little annoyed. He starts landing outside leg kicks on you, lands a right hand uh, across. You duck another one, but then you answer big. Two right hands, and as Tito absorbs the right hands, he goes for a takedown attempt, and you stuff that. And I felt like that was an early turning point moment for as big as that takedown was early where he surprised you with the head kick off the start. Uh, you not only seem to catch him good with those right hands, but you stuff the shit out of that takedown. This was, this was Michigan State wrestling. This is what it's all about. Yeah, it was huge because at that point, like, he, he couldn't just take me down and be able to find a way to rest on top, you know. Even going for a takedown for him and even securing a takedown was going to be a lot of work. And, and at that point, when you start doing it to a fighter, making him realize that, you know, the, 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 the squeeze may be uh, not, not worth it, then they start taking less and less shots. You know, they start, they don't want to shoot as much because they're like, do I got enough gas tank? Because if he counters me, then I'm going to be too tired and he may be in a better position. So that's what I was starting to try to hopefully try to get Tito to see. A minute 30 left in round one. There's a clinch against the cage and Tito catches you square in the old ball bag with a knee. Rogan screams, knee to the balls. But John McCarthy, not in position to see it. You grimace. Big John's just like, fight on, man. I mean, I don't know what happened there. It looked like that hurt though, Rashad. Oh, it did hurt. It did hurt. It caught me at, at a loose spot. You know, sometimes there's a little a little crease that can happen that, that you don't really, uh, that, that, that you're a little you know, your little deal bagger get caught in and, <laughs> and it held a little, it hurt a little bit. Maybe the first of uh, some questionable tactics here from Tito Ortiz. Uh, 115, the action goes to the ground. You do a move that Randy Couture says Rashad does a little sit through and a crotch lift, all preventing Tito from taking you down. So, uh, you know, you purposely sat to the ground and then kind of had a high C on him to lift him up, Rashad. Uh, all, all textbook wrestling moves here? all textbook wrestling and that's just me trying to find a way to make all of his wrestling moves you know something that I can score off of and I did a really good job of that in, con in college you know I was a great counter wrestler and uh, that was my game so when he shot in on me I'm like okay cool I'm gonna counter him and make him work harder and uh, I, I do regret the fact that when I did get in position I wasn't landing the right shots you know I wasn't going enough for the uppercuts and stuff like that when I got in good position. All right, big moment coming up directly after this. You both stand up, but as you stand, you get Tito's back and you land a right hand from behind that seems to, to rock him because he spins quickly to force the clinch. Now we're seeing the effects of a cut. Right below Tito's right eye, you're seeing blood dripping down. Uh, he spins in, you trade punches, but he's really looking to tie you up. And uh, with 15 seconds to go in that round, Tito works a high single along the cage, but you stuff that again. Rogan giving you a huge praise for that and the inside knee you landed to end round one. It seems, Rashad, like you had a nice finish there to round one. You cut him, you land a big knee, you stuff consecutive takedowns. You got to be feeling high and mighty at this point. I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I'm kind of disappointed the fact that I, I got taken down and I felt as if I was a little bit flat and I felt as if like I wasn't dominating how I thought I was going to. But at the same point, I felt like I was still in it and I felt as if like things were going to turn around. And, and if I can get him in the positions that I had him in at the end of that round, then I can still win this fight. One thing that I did start to realize in, in, at the end of that first round was that, you know, these old guys got a bunch of different tricks. You know, Tito Ortiz, he would grab my shorts and he was grabbing the inside of my glove and he was doing all these things <laughs> that, that, that the referee really couldn't see. But it's, these are the veteran moves, you know? The, that's the only way you're going to learn these veteran moves by going with these veterans. And I was getting a world-class schooling on veteran moves right there live. Well, despite your good finish to the round to maybe take back some momentum, Joe Rogan screaming, great round for Tito Ortiz. Do you remember feeling in the corner as if you won or lost that round? I remember feeling like I, I may have lost that round. I felt as if like it was, it was a close round, but for the most part, I felt like, you know, he, he was more active and he kept my back against the cage. And that's something that we, we talked about uh, me staying off, keep my back away from the cage. But, you know, he brought a lot of pressure and uh, you know, him throwing those hard strikes and going underneath was something that I really, really wasn't prepared for. I, I didn't really think that he had the ability to, to get underneath me that fast after he th threw a hard strike. 
Tito's corner between rounds, calming him down, saying the cut's not a big deal. They show some replays, and Joe Rogan accuses you of leading with your thumb on the right hand that that hit a Tito who had his back to you. Uh, any truth to that? Did you cut him with an exposed thumb? I mean, I don't know. I, I was hey, hey, I don't know. I was just throwing a punch. I could have. I honestly, <laughs> I could have. I'll be honest. I could have. It, it looked like I may have, but. At that point, I was just throwing. You know what I'm saying? I got this big old gorilla on top of me, and if he get me in position, I'm in trouble. So first opportunity I had, I was just throwing punches. I didn't realize that my hand may have been open a little bit, but, you know, I seen an opening, and I just went for it. Joe goes on to say that the cut is actually the perfect shape of your the tip of your thumb, but says, look, it's below the eye, <laughs> not going to be an issue. Between rounds, we get a live shot of pride welterweight Hayato Sakurai. Uh, sitting cage side and posing with a fist. Uh, any, do you remember anything of that? Why was he there? What's the deal there? That was when the, the Pride and, and UFC merger was like, you know, still happening. And there are some still guys from Pride that was making their way over to the UFC. Uh, he had, he had knocked out Mac Danzig two months earlier at Pride 33. I looked him up though. He did only have one fight in the UFC. And that was five years earlier, 2002, when he got stopped by Matt Hughes attempting to capture the UFC title. So, uh, it, you know, interesting little bit of uh, Japanese MMA legendary just dropped right in the middle of that. Rashad, we go into round two. You are dancing from the outside early. A lot of people think in 10-9 Ortiz. Here we go. You both land right hands, but at 420 of the first round, very stiff jab by Tito. And Randy says that Tito's using the right kick a lot. And I don't think Rashad expected that. Uh, what Were these leg strikes having any impact? They, they were having an impact, the fact that they were just kind of throwing me off. You know, he, he did throw me off with his leg kicks, and he was throwing them really good. And uh, he had some pretty good snap on his leg kicks. He really did. But, um, you know, for the most part, my legs, they, they still felt good, but it was just the timing of the leg kicks that really threw me off. Uh, the pace slows incredibly at 355. Tito misses a right hand. You shoot in underneath it. Nice sprawl by Ortiz to stop it. And now we got Rogan going, hey, you know, I don't know. Rashad looks very tentative. Couture jumps in. He says, yeah, I think you're right. And I and he goes, I think Rashad gave away the first round. Well, hey, that's their job, Rashad, okay? That's their job. <laughs> Those haters. Well, listen, I thought that shot was pretty good. And here's why. Because even though it was a little bit from the outside, I was able to turn a corner. And when you're able to turn a corner, you can kind of cinch that hip down and pull him down. But Tito Ortiz did a really good job of sprawling out on that shot. Uh, Goldie continues his analysis. He thinks Tito is modeling Chuck Liddell's right hand, but using it as a means to set up the takedown. Uh, at this point in the fight and based on your preparation, did you have much fear for Tito's stand-up game in terms of those right hands? No, I didn't. I, I, one thing that Tito did have, Tito had a damn good jab. He had a really, really good jab that came out really good that caught me a few times and messed up my timing. But for, for the most part, outside of his jab, you know, he had a pretty good uppercut as well, too, that he'll catch me on a uh, on the fence, but nothing from the overhand right side was, was it really affecting me. Uh, not much going on this round. I got to agree with the announcers here at about 310. Uh, Rogan points out that he doesn't feel like you're finding your rhythm. Tito forces another clinch. And then Randy says, hey, look, we've seen this before. Rashad has trouble pulling the trigger. And I think he dances around too much. Hey, hey, Randy, chill out. All right. We're talking about a Hall of Famer right here. Okay, brother. I mean, come on. Uh, any any agreement, though? with the analysis here, it, both guys look a little bit flat, to be honest. In round yeah, two. for sure. For sure. They're, they're right on, you know, I was, I was having a hard time, you know, just kind of finding a way to sort out my game and find a way to implement the game plan that we worked on, you know, somewhere in between, uh, you know, getting my ass with a little bit in the first round and just kind of feeling frustrated. It, it was, it was kind of like, um, you know, a, a little bit disheartening for myself. So I'm like trying to remember the game plan or I'm not remember I'm trying to implement the game plan, but at the same time, make the adjustments that I need to make in order to get ahead in this fight. You're working the clinch uh, with Tito's back to the cage. Two times you go for a takedown and he stuffs it. He lands a nice knee to your body in between, but at 205 of that second round, a, a, a big turn of events, he grabs the fence to prevent going down on that second takedown. Big John McCarthy jumping right in with a warning. Did you know that's what he's doing? You're talking about these veteran tricks he's doing. Could, could you tell he's doing that as it's happening? Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. I, I seen it a little bit, but for the most part, I just felt like he's really anchored in here, you know, but I felt as if like once I got it, like I had, I had him good that time. Like if I would have gotten that time, 
I would have really sent them and landed inside control. And that's what I really want to do. I like to grab the legs. And then as I'm lifting up, I like to move my knee behind it. So then I put them in a horizontal position and then I drop them down. That way I could land in side control. And that was going to be that takedown. I knew if I got side control on Tito Ortiz, he would have been toast. Uh, look, be honest here, under two minutes to go, no one's really doing anything. Both guys look tired, some sloppy punching. Both of you trying to work in elbows in the clinch, not too much success. You miss a right hand and you shoot. Tito stuffs it nicely. Tito comes back with a double leg attempt. You stuff it. A lot of clinch work, but at 105 in round two, Tito picks you up at the waist. A big energy move here. Takes you down. And Rogan said, uh, I could tell Rashad, uh, he's probably not cutting much weight at all. Tito could be a heavyweight here. A lot of talk still about the size differential. That seemed like a somewhat easy takedown. Did it surprise you? It did surprise me because, you know, once again, he got underneath me again, but then he got underneath me deeply. Before, I felt as if, like, I was able to mount a little bit of a, of a defense and able to get my hips down, but he just caught me too high, got underneath, and got it easing up. Well, to your credit here, the whole idea of this round being up for grabs, big takedown for Tito. Uh, you got right up to your feet quick. You land a nice counter shot. Randy gives you praise. Uh, you take Tito down with 17 seconds to go, and as you're taking Tito down, Tito grabs the fence. John, big John McCarthy in the moment, doesn't stop the action, screams out that Tito has lost a point for violating the second warning here, which is going to be a big factor on the scorecards at the end of the day. But there is under 20 seconds to go. You've got Tito on his back. I'm thinking, okay, it's ground and pound time. But to Tito's credit, the veteran catches you in a guillotine with his back on the ground and holds it there until the horn. Rashad, give us the details. How'd you get caught in it? How close were you to potential peril in this one? Well, being being a younger fighter, like once I once I got the takedown and John McCarthy said something, I'm listening to what he's saying. So I'm trying to sort out what he's saying. At the same time, I'm not truly paying attention to the position of my head. And at that point, Tito catches me slipping and he puts it in. And I was like, all right, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. But then it did start getting it tight. But I had my shoulder on the other side, the opposite side. So it allowed me to have some air. And uh, but it, it was it was tight for a second, though. It was tight for a second. The buzzer sounds. Joe Rogan speculates. That's a close call right there. That's a near <laughs> submission. Tito had it in very deep. And Tito Ortiz is suddenly a badass now, stands up over you, blood <laughs> dripping again from his eye, and he's glaring at you. Uh, are you are you with him in that moment? You I, I, I hated that moment. I hated that moment. It felt as if like he was trying to raise his leg on me at that moment, and it just pissed me off. And, and honestly speaking, at that point, I was like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hurt this dude. I really want to hurt this dude. All right. Randy and Joe speculate that's a nine, nine round with Tito losing the point. So they kind of have Tito up two rounds to nothing in theory here. They take away the point for holding the fence. Very, you know, very stern and, and critical call by John McCarthy. Uh, Randy Couture has got some advice for you between rounds says Rashad really needs to make something happen to get back into this fight. Joe Rogan interrupts him and goes, this is do or die for Rashad Evans. <laughs> Was there that same energy or urgency in the Jackson wink corner between rounds. It was, it really was, you know, uh, Greg Jackson, let me have it that round. Uh, Mike, Mike Winkle, John as well. You know, they told me I needed to go. Uh, Van was telling me, Hey, Ev, 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 you got to shoot. You got to go. You got to go. And uh, you know, I, I, I was trying, I was really trying, but Tito, Tito was a lot tougher than I thought. And, and maybe, and just maybe his demise may have been greatly over-exaggerated by myself. I mean, at that point I was thinking like, this dude is tougher than I've ever thought. Well, for all the confidence you suddenly had in him, he had to use what was in his gas tank to keep you away those first two rounds because he comes out in round three and uh, he's potentially noticeably tired here. It seems to look like you land a very nice left hook as Tito stepped in to force the clinch. And suddenly Randy Couture is going, hey, look, Tito's fighting a slower pace. Uh, he's like, <laughs> he goes, but... <laughs> Rashad has got to stop dancing if he wants to get this done. Uh, Couture also reporting he sees some swelling around your left eye. Any truth to that in memory? Um, yeah, I had, I had a little bit of uh, swelling in my, my eye. I think it was from, from those jabs that he was hitting me with. It started to swell up a little bit for the most part. But, I, I mean, I, 
I, I could see it wasn't not, it wasn't causing me any kind of problems. It was just something that happens in a fight. You know, I got these big old puffy ass eyes. They swell easy. So, you know, you 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 breathe around me wrong, they might puff up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it, it don't take much to make my eyes puff up. And I'm used to getting puffed up. So I wasn't too worried about them getting puffed up. I was just more focused on the fact that now I needed to string together some kind of conf uh, combinations so I can get them down. But the problem was, I was like, if I throw combinations, that was the reason, that was probably the main reason why I was like one piece in them at a time, throwing one patch at a time, because I felt as every time I went for a combination, he would go underneath me. That's, that's a fair, yeah, that is true. And he was, he was sort of calculatingly waiting for that. And uh, uh, Joe, at, with one minute into the final round here, uh, Joe Rogan says Rashad's got to be reckless straight up. Everyone's sort of recognizing here that Tito's taking a step back. He's slowing down. You land a beautiful right hand. But just eight seconds later, 352 remaining, Tito takes you down. Uh, you can tell he was labored in doing it, but that's a good momentum stopper right there for the veteran. It was. It really was. You know, that was a clutch position for him to get me in. And it caught me by surprise because, you know, once again, it was another easy takedown for him. And I was kind of mad at that point. I'm like, man, I got to find something. I got I to do something about this because this fight is getting away from me. Uh, Randy's starting to speculate. Maybe Tito's overtrained. You mentioned potentially you and Nate Marquardt were as well. It's just so, certainly a huge fight. Uh, you're working really hard here. He's on top, but you're sitting up. You're trying to stay off your back. And Rashad Evans grabs the fence and gets a warning from Big John to avoid ending up on his back. Uh, in that moment, are you thinking like, oh, crap, he just took a point away from, uh, from you know, Tito in record fashion almost here. Are you a little worried after that? I was nervous, nervous, man. I was like, I did not want to get away at one point that I just got. So uh, at that point, I'm like, you know what? I, and I honestly, I didn't realize that I was even grabbing a cage. I was just trying to reach back and try to find some way to get up. I thought I was going to reach back and hit more canvas, but it actually ended up being on the cage. But no excuses here. You know, Tito Ortiz in that position was what was an absolute monster on top. And even for me to get back up and, and to be able to stay in a position that I was able to be in, with him on top, it was a, uh, it was a win for me, you know? Yeah. And then I don't expect you by the way to, uh, as a fighter with the reaction time you need to have to remember, or even have had deep thoughts in between these moves, but I appreciate the introspection just the same. Uh, Tito gets mount with three minutes to go, but you scrambled out of it instantly to your credit. Uh, Tito tries to high single you 30 seconds later. And Randy's like saying, uh, look, Tito Ortiz is becoming relentless again, but Rashad showing just the same relentlessness in blocking the takedown. So we're at a point here, Rashad, we're about under three minutes to go in the final round. A lot of ways, the fight's up for grabs. Both of you really trying to, to shoot, to try to uh, contain the other guy, both being pretty stubborn in terms of the uh, takedown defense. Are you thinking, I got I might have to knock this guy out. Where are you at right at this point? If you can remember, I still was thinking I need to get him down and ground and pound. I don't know why I just felt as if like, when we were standing with the punches, I didn't feel like I can get him out of there with the hands. I felt as if like, if I got him down, he would be done. You know, I felt as if like with, with Tito, you know, when, when I got him down at one time, he, he, get, he let out like a, you know, like, like, a, like he, he wasn't going to fight if I got him down, you know, and, and I really felt that if I got him there, he would have been done. Well, there's certainly in interesting dynamics in the striking battle here in the sense that you've basically uh, said that, look, you're not looking to land combos because you don't want him to take you down. Well, he's also not looking to stand and trade with you. It seems like anytime you land a punch, he's getting you right back into that standing clinch. Uh, 220 to go in the final round. Rogan really pushing the narrative that Rashad needs something big here. Tito gets you in the close K close quarters though, standing clinch. And he lands one of those McGregor on cowboy shoulder strikes <laughs> in the standing clinch. But here's the deal. It looked like it landed flush and big John broke you guys apart immediately after two minutes to go in the final round, Rashad. I felt like that benefited you. It looked like Tito had some sort of advantage here. No, he, he did. He did he hit the, he hit the elbow. I mean, hit the, uh, the, the big shoulder and it kind of like, it didn't hurt, but at the same time, it kind of like messed up my balance a little bit. But uh, I appreciated the separation because I needed it. You know, Tito Ortiz, it is super hard to get off, like on the cage, was acting as if like we were on the floor, you know, having them pressure on me. And I just need to find some way to get some kind of space. But it, it was hard to keep Tito off me. Well, you felt some urgency there because as soon as you guys break apart, you're landing big punches. Randy's thinking Tito's looking very labored in there with a minute and a half to go. Uh, Tito's slowing down considerably, but they're thinking 
I, I still don't think Rashad is doing enough. Rogan saying, look, Rashad's moving away, and this is the most weary. We've seen Tito up to this point. Rashad's not doing anything about it. Uh, how's your stamina situation here in the final final closing minute? My stamina is good. You know, I felt as if honestly, like, like I waited too long to fight. You know, I felt as if like, um, I, I, I may have, may have given him a little bit too much respect when, when, when he was, uh, when he was getting me, getting me into troubles that he was getting me into. And at that point I started to realize that I could beat this dude. Like I, I, I can beat this dude. Like he, he's not better than me. He's not better than me. So I, I need to go out there and I need to find a way to get this fight over with. Well, here's where you saved the fight in the final minute to your full credit. Tito tries a takedown attempt with 48 seconds to go that Randy Couture called desperate. You stuffed it with ease with a nice sprawl. And um, this is where Randy goes, look, I think Rashad can win this fight with a flurry of punches. As if he's speaking into your earpiece, you respond with an elbow in the clinch. And with 13 seconds to go, you let your hands go big shots and a huge takedown here, Rashad. This is starting to look like the exclamation point that's going to save you the fight. You land some punches down below. They, We stop. We go to the end of the fight, the horn blasts, and you stand up celebrating as if you had won it. What, did you think you'd <laughs> won it in that moment? I mean, I felt it was close. I really felt it was close. But, you know, ending around the way that it did, I felt as if I, as if I did win the fight. You know, I felt as if, like, um, you know, it, it was going to be close. But I felt like I, I definitely – uh, made him, made him feel me. And, and, um, when I had him down, he, he let out a sound. And when I was ground and pounding him, he was covering up and I was like, oh, he's done. And I felt it. And at that point, that's when I felt the sting of just like, I should have, and I could have, and I wish I would have. That's what I felt. I felt immediate regret. Like, dude, why didn't I do this earlier? It was just right there. I'd felt upon rewatch this morning, Rashad, that uh, damn, did you need that final minute and, and credit to you for pulling it off? Because if you don't get that takedown and that punch that set it up and just that look to the judges of being on top as the fight ends, having a moment, you know, you're probably not going to get that third round and you're probably going to lose this fight. So we're heading to the scorecards. Uh, a little bit of drama here. Uh, Rogan and Randy Couture think it's a draw. They go to unofficial scorer Eddie Bravo. I totally forgot he had served in this role. He scored it a draw with his quote of Rashad nullified Tito's ground and pound, and he got up off his back, but Evans did not do enough to dominate and win clearly. He's got it a draw. You embrace Tito, kind of a half hug, nothing mean, but not too nice. We go to Bruce Buffer, and it's 28-28, 28-28, and 28-28, the crowd boos the decision because who the hell likes a draw? And Rashad Evans drops to his knees seemingly in disbelief before you and Tito do a legit hug. Are you mad? Are you mad at yourself? Did you think the judges got it right? Where are you at right there? I'm mad at myself for the most part. I just felt as if like um, I, I didn't do what, what, I, what I trained to do. I didn't do what I talked that I was going to do. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was a learning lesson for me, you know, um, you know, because Tito Ortiz was a lot better than I thought. And uh, I just wasn't, I wasn't able to implement my game plan the way that I felt that I was going to. And, you know, it, it was, it was a lot that I felt like I could have done, but I left a lot that I left a lot out. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, expend it all because I still had a lot of legs left. Like I still was still bouncy and bouncy at, you know, in, in the cage. And I felt as if, you know, if I were to use some of that bounce to, you know, push the pace a little bit more and, and go forward and start to, you know, put the cut, put together a couple of jabs and, and just, you know, start to build an offense, then I would have been able to uh, have the fight that I wanted to fight. But it was one of the greatest learning lessons that I had in a fight. You know, I learned so much, in that fight. And it was, um, it was the first time that I really was in a position in the cage where I felt as if like I may lose. Yeah. And for the respect that you're giving Tito right now, he gave you the same after the fight. You can tell he was surprised. He said, talking to Joe Rogan in the cage, it wasn't my best performance, but Rashad is tough as hell. A lot tougher than I thought he'd be. His takedown defense is great. Tito turns to the crowd, said, are you satisfied? They booed him. And he said, look, Rashad, because it's a draw, 
we can do it again. Uh, he was specifically asked about losing the point, which as we saw on the scorecards prevented Tito from winning this fight as it seemed clear that he won round two. Uh, he said, look, it's an instinct to grab the fence. And he also added, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And look, we're about a year removed from the uh, Ricky Bobby uh, Talladega Nights movie there. So that that's that's well done on Tito's corny ass. Uh, he gave <laughs> you the full respect. Rashad gets interviewed. Uh, you're like, yeah, boo the decision. I thought I had that fight, but maybe I didn't work as hard as I should have. I guess those are the breaks. You did echo what you just said, that you had felt Tito break with that final takedown that, you know, maybe more time you could have stopped him. You thought you could have had him there. And then you said, please, Dana, Tito, Rashad, two. And then you shout out hard nutrition three separate times. So I'm going to assume <laughs> they, were, they were padding your paycheck there. Yeah, but guess what? They never paid me. They owe me 17 grand for oh, saying that. They still, are, they, to this day. are they still a company? Because we can't. No, nah, they're, they're done. They're done, though. But they owe me for that. They owe me uh, that. Oh, man, you got three shout outs, hard nutrition. That's soft. Uh, Rashad, the whole idea of a rematch, both fighters seem to want it. The crowd didn't love the draw, but they seemed to like the fight overall. Did you think, yeah, we'll do it again next? Yeah, I thought so. I thought we'll, we'll be able to run a rematch back, but, you know, I still had a lot of uh, improvement to do on my game. And, um, you know, the UFC were kind of like, mm, yeah, we're not going to do another one. I think, you know, I think at that point, um, after that fight, Cheetah won and UFC kind of had like a falling out or something, and they kind of, you know, parted ways for a little bit, but it would have been great to get back in there and have another chance at Tito Ortiz, but I'm glad that we did get the rematch when we did. <laughs> yeah, the draw delayed Tito's fall here uh, at just 32 years old, but a lot of fights under his belt. He would come back a little bit less than a year later, lose a decision to Leoto Machida at UFC 84, lose a split decision to Forrest Griffin after that, and then lose a unanimous decision the following year to Matt Hamill, we remember he kind of resurrected himself with that surprise submission win over Ryan Bader, but then he would lose to you, Big Nog, and Forrest Griffin again to close out his UFC career. For you, Rashad, uh, look, I, I feel like you got saved by this draw in a sense, meaning this loss really could have detoured the run you went on immediately after. I know Dana, uh, uh, Joe Silva, Lorenzo, look, they're businessmen, so they'll, they'll be harsh if they have to. Did anyone treat you afterwards like this was a loss and that you got lucky or was it encouraging your building towards something here? No, nah, you know, they, they, they treated it as a loss. You know, they were, they, they kind of acted as, you know, they were like, uh, you, you got lucky, but for the most part, um, you know, they, they, they gave, they gave me some props, you know, uh, Tito was a tough out and, um, you know, I, I was an ultimate fighter guy, you know what I'm saying? So to see the ultimate fighter guy competing on, on the stage is, is as, as a long time, you know, great, uh, UFC fighter as Tito Ortiz, you know, you know, five time champion, uh, you know, it, it was, it was a big deal for me, but, um, I didn't, I wasn't as far along as I thought I was. And, uh, it, it served as a real good recalibration moment for me in my career. And, and I felt like it was, it was beneficial. I'm glad that I didn't get the win because of the fact that even if, if I got the win, I don't know if I would have been able to do as well as I did because, I needed to be able to have that experience the way that I did in order to know what I need to do to get better. And this is why I love, you know, your honesty and introspection, but also going second by second through some of these early fights. We're watching the evolution firsthand. You had to learn here, you know, balancing the gas tank, being more aggressive with your strikes. So the judges have no doubt. Uh, look, you made some great strides with takedown defense. You know, your, your poise was pretty strong. You finished better. Uh, there, you know, some, some good, some bad there. But not getting the loss here and not having to really start over it set you up for the run that would be that would come later this year. You get the split decision win over Michael Bisping, and then it's KO Chuck Liddell and TKO Forrest Griffin for the title. This was in the end, really, Rashad. It was the the last stop, the last real. I mean, look, I'm not going to say Bisping was a test. It was split decision, but this was your last sort of. Is he ready to be elite? Is he ready for the title or not? I don't know. Did you pass? Did you fail? You broke even, but you, you kept winning after this. So it was a big turning point in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I I broke even, but at the end of the day, I felt as if like I passed. I passed. I passed the test that that I felt like I needed to pass, and that was um, the one that that showed that I was able to compete with these guys. When I first got into the UFC, I remember when I won the Ultimate Fighter show. I was with my friends back in Niagara Falls, and they're like. 
oh man, you really think you can beat Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz and those guys? And, and we've been all big UFC fans, but you know, at, at that point, I was like, yeah, I mean, we're in a UFC together. I mean, I, I feel like I can, but you know, the level of just like, you know, them seeing me in that capacity was like, there's no way, there's no effing way that you can beat these guys. I mean, you're a good fighter, but those guys are like exceptional fighters. And then to be able to go in there and hang with, you know, one of those guys, for me, it was a big, uh, a, a big confidence booster. Even though I didn't get the win, it felt as if like I had something to hang my hat on. And, and now I knew the kind of work and where I need to get better at. Uh, Tito, as we mentioned, would go on a, a le fairly legitimate skid here. It would take you four years to get the rematch. Look, we want to keep doing this series and go big fight by big fight. But to put the, the bow on Tito right here, you would win the rematch by second round TKO in 2011. Uh, was there any talk throughout your build to the title, winning the title, losing to Machida, rebounding with big pay-per-views with Rampage? Was there ever, did Tito ever pop up again? Did it surprise you when it did come around again in 2011? No, nah, you know, it, uh, at that point, once I started to catch, um, you know, catch some wind in my sails, uh, Tito, Tito never talked about fighting me again. When he did fight me again, um, it was because Phil Davis fell out of that fight and he took it as a last minute type of thing, but I was not his first choice. And that's what I like. Because here's the reality of the situation, BC. No matter what happens in a fight, I always said this. I want to make my opponent feel me to the point where he never wants to fight me again. So he didn't want to fight me, but he ended up doing it anyways. Uh, Rashad, people will be upset that I asked this question, but you know what I'm made of inside. All right. <laughs> I'm made of uh, hot dogs with cheese in the middle. <laughs> Let's say there was an organization that said, Hey, Rashad, man, you're looking great. You know, the abs and the photos and you know, Tito's an asshole. Everyone wants to punch Tito. Is there a number we can get you to to punch Tito for a third time? Is there? A, uh, does everyone have a price for the million dollar man? I mean, what's going on here? I'll fight Tito again. I almost definitely. You know, when I seen Tito fighting Chuck Liddell again, I was like, man, I, 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 can, I, I will beat the hell out of Tito right now. You know? <laughs> yes, you would. Yes, you would. I would. I, I would have fought Tito. I definitely would have fought Tito again. Um, one thing. Here's the thing about Tito. When I fought Tito the second time, I broke my hand on, on when mm. I was fighting Tito. And here's one thing that I learned from the first time. So guys with heads like that, big heads like that, you're not going to knock them out with a punch because they can take a big, big strike. You got to go to the body. You got to go to the body. And that's something that I, I've learned uh, with fighting Tito. You know, Tito's, Tito's head, it allows him to take just an extreme amount of punishment with that head. Like it, it's really rare that you see Tito just like sprawl laid out knocked out unconscious from a shot normally he just like he covers up and then a fight is stopped you know you don't really see him get knocked out and the reason why is because he's got this big ass head and it's hard <laughs> you hit this head and you break it damn hand yeah, you did get him to the body with the knees and the rematch it was your third win and a string of four which led you to the john jones fight so great moments in a great career rashad love love breaking it down with you piece by piece hoping the people are uh, that Love this in the past. Followed us here on Morning Combat. Uh, if this is your first foray into Morning Combat, you know we're hitting you over the head with three live shows a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Luke Thomas and your boy, BC. We get Rashad in here ahead of the big ones. He's part of our universe. A lot of great bonus content. Check out our interview with Eddie Alvarez this week if you want more. But Rashad Evans, uh, let's put a final bow on it. Uh, anything else? You always have something extra at the end. You're like, oh, yeah, did I tell you about the time I pissed my pants during the Brad Arms fight and no one noticed? <laughs> anything else here we're forgetting? No, I, I, th I, think, I, think, I think we covered it, man. I think we, I think we got it all down. You know, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great experience, a great card all the way through. We, you know, we had Harmies Franco on that card. It was just like a who's who on the UFC stat card. And uh, it was my first time really being on a – like a scale that big with Anderson Silva and, and Tito Ortiz. So it, it, it was a big moment for me, man. Yeah. And uh 16 K woo, Rashad, Rashad, woo, you know, balling, but that yeah. backroom bonus was the backroom bonus was decent, man. I think he gave me, uh, I think they gave me like 60 K in the back room. Oh, so I, all right. All right. Shut, look, I, I, I was, I was happy with that. I, that with, with that and my sponsors, I was pretty good. I made it, I made it pretty decent. 
We love it. We love it. That is Sugar Rashad Evans, your UFC Hall of Famer. Follow him at Sugar Rashad Evans on all the social media channels. I'm your boy, BC. Uh, That's it. That's all we got for you. Uh, So for everyone, Showtime, Malka, CBS Sports, the great Mikey Mormile on the ones and twos. And for this Hall of Famer, Rashad, you got two words for the people to leave with? BC, we out.